Well, here we are again, back with you with uh, another effort to get a part of the gospel message across and, and uh, share truth, share the, those truths with uh, our church family and any others that uh, care to, to join in with us. I'm looking this, this time today at uh, a passage of scripture, I'm, I'm back in the book of Acts. We were, we were going through that uh, prior to this shutdown that we've experienced, and I'm back in there again today, and trying to, trying to come in where, or approximately where we left off uh, the last time we we were in the book of Acts. Uh, about three or four weeks ago. Today, the last time, as I recall, I, we were we were dealing with Paul's message in uh, in Athens at Mars Hill, and today we're we're jumping in right immediately after that after he had finished what he was going to do or his, the ministry that he in, undertook while he was in Athens. And here we're in verse, in chapter 18 of Acts and beginning with the very first of that chapter, it says, after these things, that was after his message there to the Athenian uh, people at, on Mars Hill and, and afterwards, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. Paul came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by an occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had, came, had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook the dust off. Excuse me. His garments and said to them, "Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, and from now on I will go to the Gentiles." And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshipped God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. We're concluding there with the 11th verse, and with that reading, I have another passage that we'll be looking at in just uh, a little bit here. Now, Corinth was just, I don't, I didn't check to see just how many miles Corinth was, uh, is from Athens, but I, it's, it's a reasonable distance, I'd say within 50 miles, 40 to 50 miles, the way it appears on the map. But Corinth was a very prominent and wealthy citizen, uh, city at, uh, at the time of Paul's ministry, but it had, it, it was an old city even then, probably, he probably had a thousand years or more of history already by the time that Paul was ministering there. And in 146 
BC, it was uh, it was overthrown by Romans and destroyed, totally destroyed by Roman by Rome during the Battle of Corinth when it, when they the Romans defeated the Greeks and uh, it was a dead city actually pretty much abandoned and just a very few people even in the area anymore for oh, just slightly over a hundred years until 44 BC when Julius Caesar uh, decided to try to rejuvenate and rebuild some of the ancient cities that had been destroyed by by uh, various conflicts. And he populated, he repopulated this area with probably what we'd call the poorer folks of that day. He took people there that kind of uh, would be looking for a a challenge and perhaps prospects of bettering themselves. Pretty much, <laughs> there's pretty much a parallel in that situation with the people that settled this country uh, a couple of hundred years ago, or began to settle it, especially, especially during the mid 80s when they were, uh, the, the mid 1800s when they were um, pushing the the boundaries westward in the in what became the United States. Uh, Corinth was a prosperous and very wealthy city even in the time of Paul, because it happened to be on the isthmus between. Uh, that, that extended a trade union, or a trade route between uh, Asia and Greece. And, and on that isthmus, they used to bring their shipping in and, and ferry the ships across the isthmus uh, into the Adriatic or back into the Aegean Sea, whichever way they were going. And there were actually two harbors at Corinth, one on each side, and the, the shipping was ferried across. They made an effort at one time, the Romans, I think, did, made an effort to build a canal across there, but they were not successful. And that didn't get accomplished until the mid-1800s by the, let's see, the French, I think, uh, the French were in there and, and uh, built built the channel across. Quite an accomplishment. Um, it was a big commercial city, and consequently, there were influences in Corinth that were pagan. Rome had a whole multitude of deities, and the Greeks had. Uh, numerous deities, and then there along you had the the Hebrews, the Jews, and they had a more strict moral and ethical code, uh, much more much more centered around uh, ethics and and uh, proper conduct and that sort of thing. And then Christianity came on the scene because John, because uh, Paul established the Christian ministry and the Christian church in Corinth. And about uh, 49 to 51 uh, AD, uh, he made his first visit there, which was the visit that we're looking at right now. And he had pretty much, he, he spent a year and a half in Corinth after, after, on his first trip, on his first journey there. He spent a year and a half there. And uh, Corinth was a church that really was on his heart 
It's evident by the letters to the Corinthians that he wrote. He, did, he apparently wrote about four different letters, and three of them are included in the two letters. They're called the two letters that we have in our Bible. But uh, you can tell just by the language that he uses in this in these letters that these this church and this ministry in Corinth was really on his heart. He wanted to see it succeed. And I, I suspect that part of the reason that it was so much on his heart is because it was such, it had so many problems as a result of Christian, Christian people attempting to live the Christian life at the same time they were, they were uh, so heavily influenced by the pagan culture that they'd come from. They, uh, the pagan influences, these people had been called and by the gospel out of a lifestyle that incorporated a lot of things in Christianity that the gospel does not endorse, very clearly does not endorse. And Paul calls attention to them in his letters and, and encourages the Christians there for their lives to change, to reflect their kinship and their relationship with Jesus Christ. This, uh, this was a this was a real problem for the Christian ministry in in that city, and uh, they they were how should I say they were uh, strongly influenced by a very uh, self-centered culture because wealth was prevalent and uh, there's something about that kind of an atmosphere that, that tends to, to encourage people to be arrogant and, and do it their own way. Like the song that I, <laughs> I've mentioned several times before, I did it my way. Well, in the Christian culture that Paul was attempting to establish there, it's not doing it my way, it's doing it his way, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the whole atmosphere in Corinth was almost totally foreign to the, to the concepts that are taught to us in the scripture. And when these people committed their lives to Christ, when they were when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when they were converted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, their lives were expected by our Lord to change. It has to have a genuine ring to it, or, or it doesn't really uh, adequately represent anything. And the reason that I mention all this, the reason that I bring it up in that, in this kind of a light, is that in reality, Corinth and the United States of America today have some very strong parallels. Uh, there is one, one outstanding uh, digression or difference. Corinth. The church and the gospel message was taken to Corinth into a culture of basically uh, very, very self-centered, satisfy yourself, and it was it was a culture that many of the the the. Uh, existing uh, influence and religious uh, influences were they were really almost debauchery if not debauchery they the prostitutes in the 
temples, uh, uh, a lifestyle of self-satisfaction or self-gratification, and uh, very much uh, a sexual-oriented culture. The United States of America is just has just the reverse of that in its culture because we came from a culture that at least, I'm not going to say it's a Christian, it was a Christian culture or we were a Christian nation because we were not. I, I'm in the sense that we were, that we were all Christian people. But the foundations of this country that were laid at the very outset were laid in the in the concepts that are taught and and prepared for us in the New Testament scripture. The 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 uh, justification for decisions that were made, the, the quotations that people used were there were more of them from the Bible than from all the other sources put together because these people believed in the concepts that are taught in the Word of God. So consequently, Corinth, Paul was trying to get the Corinthians to adopt the principles and teachings that are in the scripture in their conduct and, and coming from the background of paganism. We, on the other hand, come from the groundwork and the, the background where we should know better because we have seen, we have experienced God's blessing and God's care for us for 250 years. And the only way I can explain or the way, the only way I can can understand the blessings that I've had in my lifetime and the availability of such fantastic privilege and blessing is because God has had his hand on this nation and has been caring for us and protecting us. He doesn't have to pass some kind of a sentence and, and in some way or another just lower the boom on America for us to get ourselves completely destroyed, all he has to do is just take his hands off and say, you want it your way? Here, you got it. I want to read for you what Paul says to the Corinthians when he was dealing with some of the practices that they were engaged in. In the beginning of... Uh, Let's see, I think it's chapter 2, 4, 6. He says this, he says, Do you not know that, uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What he's, what he's saying here is these things are out of character for the ones, for the people who belong to Jesus Christ. These things are not, and, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not passing judgment. I am saying, though, that I have lived through a transition in this country and in most of the Western world, but I've lived through the time of a transition of this nation 
when I have seen the practices that the scriptures themselves very clearly, this is the roadmap that God gave to us for us to follow in our walk with him. We don't earn our salvation. That is a gift from God. But he expects us to reflect the image and, and learn to re reflect the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my lifetime, not only in the nation, but in, in much of the church today, the influences of, of our culture, which is changing into one that is more like the pagan culture of Paul's day than it is like the Christian culture, the, the, the practices that people are endorsing and even some churches are endorsing, uh, uh, it's just unbelievable because it is a lifestyle that is condemned in the scripture. I'm not scolding, I'm simply saying, I've watched this happen. And when, it, when, I, when I first began to notice it, I had no idea that it was as serious as it was. I really was kind of blinded by some kind of a confidence false confidence that this this country would never change like that but we most certainly have and and the nation has accepted practices and and conduct that is absolutely uh, i i would have said 50 60 years ago it'll never happen in the united states it'll, i'll never see this kind of thing happen but i have seen it and I am ashamed of myself for not recognizing it for what it was early enough. We have let it go on so long. I, I, I doubt seriously if in the last 10 years I have had a, the occasion to perform a wedding ceremony more than two or three times where the people have not lived together for some extended period of time before they ever bothered to get married. We're treating our marriage and our commitment in marriage, we're treating it like we were buying a new hat or a pair of shoes. Uh, that's not what God had in mind. God had something beautiful prepared for us. He instituted marriage. He instituted the, the sexual relationship. But he intended it to be a beautiful thing that draws two people together in commitment to each other. And, and uh, he, it has been turned into something where so often and so much of the time, people use each other. In one way or another, God never intended for one person to use another. That was not what he had in mind. He, did, he made something gorgeous and beautiful and something that, that can fulfill and, and challenge. And we have turned it into, just like, it's, just like the scriptures talked about here, these things have no place in the house of God. We need to get on our knees before the throne and repent in our own lives for even accepting and condoning things that are abhorrent to the God of the universe. On the other hand, at the same time, we need to have a very tender heart for the people who are deceived into, into uh, living this kind of a lifestyle, wherever they are. Because the fact of the matter is, God's grace is sufficient. What did Paul say here to the Corinthian church? He's, he talks about these 
in the in the sixth chapter he talks about these things he said in with these practices you cannot get into the kingdom with these practices and then he says in the 11th verse and such were some of you but you were washed but you were sanctified uh, God has forgiven. He forgives, and that's his mercy, and that's his blessing to you. He forgives, but you need to put aside these things that were a part of your life and live in such a fashion that it shows the world that you are different. And the reason that you're different is not because you're such a goody-goody. The reason that you're different is not because somehow or other you are, have a superior intelligence or something. The reason that you are different is because the God of all the universe has forgiven and has filled you with a new life and a new hope and a new prospect and a new destiny. And because of that, he has changed your life. Uh, I guess we can't emphasize that uh, enough. It doesn't mean that we reject everybody if they don't agree with us. But I have watched, I have watched in the last, particularly in the last two or three years, every once in a while I'll get somewhere where there's, where uh, somebody is watching a news or some kind of a some kind of a discussion or debate, and I've watched people who are supposed to be the elite of our land. They're supposed to be our leaders, and our those that are are uh, giving us some kind of direction, and watch them discuss issues that they don't agree on, and to me, they act like kindergartners in a sandbox. Like somehow or other, everybody wants to talk, nobody wants to listen. We need to listen. We need to hear what people are saying, but we also need to speak, and when we speak, we need to speak truth, we need to speak truth from the word. Truth has been, pr truth has been killed by our present day culture. We have, we have, as, as we were, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier this evening that uh, we, <laughs> we don't, truth is something that we don't, uh, we don't accept anymore. It's my truth and your truth, and I have my truth, you have your truth, and uh, both of them are right. Even though they're divergent, completely diverse from each other, they're both right because it's my truth and your truth. There is no objective truth accepted in the elite circles in this country, and that is the tragedy of it. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, the, the education system does not, does not teach how to learn. They teach what to think. Not how to learn to think, but what to think. God help us, we need to repent. We need to do it on our knees before the throne. And we need the support of the Holy Spirit to live our lives and to stand up for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that truth was ridiculed in Paul's day 
If you read the account in, in the book of Acts of Paul's ministry from one city to another, and everywhere he went, every city he went to, sooner or later, they raised their voice against him because people have not changed, folks. There's always an element of people that don't want to hear truth. There's always a certain number of people that do not want to listen to anything that talks about their need for a savior or their need for redemption or their need for hope. Our God is a God of hope. He is the Lord Jesus Christ came and died that we might have hope. And that's the message we need to get out. And it, if, it, if there's any message to Christianity at all, it's a message that God's in the business of changing us. And we need that changing. We need that message over and over and over again. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for listening. Yeah.